Let's go back to our top to one of our top talking points being the elections still underway or the counting at least of votes in the US. They've long been held up as a model of accountability and representative government and a model that's been copied by so many um, nations across the world, especially here in Africa. Uh, let's uh, pick the brain now of um, uh, Dr. Stimbile Mbete, who's written a very interesting opinion piece that appeared in yesterday's Mail and Guardian entitled, America's Democracy is Broken. What does that mean for us? And she joins us via Skype from here in Johannesburg. Um, Dr. Mbete, thank you so much for joining us so early this morning. But we were saying, when there are elections like this underway, who has time for sleep? So thank you so much exactly. for, for, for joining us. Uh, now, uh, a quote from an earlier piece that you tweeted earlier this week really stood out for us, for me anyway. And you said that the founding fathers expected the U.S. electorate to always be white men. And since then, the system has been shaped and reshaped to, to protect those very same interests. Um, and I thought that was so true because so many people don't understand that this very, what to us seems like a very weird electoral system, is something that was put in place when America looked and felt very, very different. Can you shed some light on why that system looks the way it is? Completely. Thanks so much for having me. And I think that, you know, what we must remember is that the Electoral College and the way in which uh, Electoral College seats um, are then distributed really comes from a time in the United States when it was a predominantly rural uh, population in a rural uh, country and where the spread of the population are, of the United States look very, very different. And now what the Electoral College has done is that uh, the vote, the weight of uh, the vote of people in uh, the, um, the so-called uh, Rust Belt, but also uh, in the middle of America and in, um, and in, the, in, in the sort of South, um, counts for far more um, than the vote of people in more populous states like um, um, California uh, or, 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 or New York State. Um, so the states that are um, on the West Coast uh, and on the East Coast. And so what that means is that you often have the American election decided um, by a smaller part of the population uh, than has actually uh, voted for the popular candidate, which is why you were able to have in 2016 a situation where Hillary Clinton won three million more uh, votes uh, than Donald Trump and still lose the election and the Electoral College uh, by a significant amount. And this has always been, um, and the re maintain, retaining the uh, Electoral College, the last time there was an attempt uh, to change the American electoral system was in the 1960s. And that um, attempt was defeated by filibuster, uh, by Southern, uh, by senators from Southern states uh, who as a response to the Civil Rights Act and who didn't want um, black people who could now vote to have um, a such a major influence uh, over the uh, election outcome. So really these dynamics of race and power um, and, and, and influence have always uh, been a really determining factor around the American electoral system. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the abiding question I keep hearing and that I myself have, have questioned is that um, if you look at the results of these latest elections that um, uh, Donald Trump has uh, received even more votes than he did in 2016 and this is after the evidence of the last four years that showed the American people just what kind of person he is and what kind of leader he is uh, but for those who really follow the, the psychology of America and their history it really isn't a surprise. And race and power and what you just spoke about being caught to that. Do you think we're afraid to call a spade a spade and that race is almost like a dirty secret in America and we don't want to say that white supremacy is a major, major core value um, of American society? Yes, I think that we are uh, afraid uh, to call a spade a spade. And I think that there is this uh, assumption that uh, with the end of the Trump presidency, that that is going to mean a kind of return to normal um, and and a 
and and the end of the kind of racialization of politics that we've seen in the past four years. And that's actually not the case. I think that even though Trump is going to leave the White House, Trumpism is going to um, outlive him uh, for, for, for quite a long time. And I think that it's part of all sorts of anxieties, uh, race anxiety on the part of um, particularly white American men about the changing demographics of that society um, and needing to really live with an America in the next 20, 30 years that will uh, not be by default uh, white and Anglo-Saxon and Protestant, uh, but rather will be will look uh, very different uh, from the uh, United States that the Founding Fathers uh, had in mind. And I think that until those until the United States faces up to those anxieties and calls them what they are, uh, we're going to have a recurrence uh, of the kind of uh, racist white nationalist politics that um, that really has buoyed up uh, the, the Trump presidency. Now, if we go back to the voting system, you say in this piece that was in the Mail and Guardian yesterday uh, that many of the markers of a free and fair election, a universal voters' role, centralized election management, uniform rules, are actually absent from the U.S. system. And yet this is a system that we've seen over the last few decades has really been adopted by many African countries. Why is that a problem? Well, so the U.S. system is um, the elections in the U.S. are organized uh, at county level, um, not even at state level. Um, and and what that means is that there's a great deal of differentiation within the system. So things like uh, what time uh, voting stations close, there is no uniformity about that uh, at all. There are no uniform electoral rules. Uh, so in some states, you need a voter ID um, uh, with um, a photographic voter ID to vote in other states you don't. Um, there's also no um, uniformity in terms of the way in which um, the uh, tally happens, which votes get counted first, and all of those things. And in the 1990s, with the third wave of democracy throughout the African continent and Eastern Europe and Latin America, uh, you know, democracy institutes all over the United States were then exporting the U.S. model of democracy. But the rules um, that they were putting in place in other places are very different um, from what uh, exists in the United States. And there's been this holding up of having free and fair elections as the ultimate marker of democracy with no thinking about, well, but how does that democracy improve the socioeconomic circumstances of people? How does it improve the well-being of people? And so elections have become the be-all and end-all uh, of, of, of democracy um, in a lot of parts of the global south, and particularly in Africa, even when uh, those uh, elections uh, exacerbate or worsen social tensions, uh, even though there is a lot of conflict and violence that surrounds elections. And so I think that what we're learning from the United... And that's exactly what's mm -hmm. happening in the United States. This election is, um, is, is worse. Uh, so many of the social tensions there. And I think that what we're learning is that we need to think differently about uh, our democracies in Africa and in a way that suits our context. But where do we even start? I mean, some might listen to you now and say, oh, Dr. Mbete, that's really nice. Go ahead and go and talk about it in your lecture halls at university. But, but is it too late? Should we be taking these kinds of conversations more seriously in Africa to look at how we come up with a type of democracy, if you want to call it that, that really suits our cultures and our histories? It's not too late. And I think that, you know, if you look at what have, the American democracy is nearly 300 years old, uh, and they are still grappling uh, with these uh, issues. And um, and so I think that the, one of the big lessons, I think, from the U.S. Uh, election is that these conversations are never over. Uh, I started the article um, in the Mail and Guardian by saying that democracy is hard work mm -hmm. uh, and you need to tweak and mold um, and not think of it as a finished product. And so I think that for many African democracies, which are only um, 20, 25 um, years old um, in many cases, uh, 
the idea that you need to be doing things perfectly each time and that there is a notion of perfection, uh, I think, has been uh, put to rest uh, by the U.S. Uh, election. And we need to think about evolving our systems to changing context, to changing circumstances, uh, and to changing demographics and issues over time. And so, um, and that conversation about adaption, about adaptation and change was always very difficult to have uh, because there was apparently this model democracy uh, that existed in the U.S. And I think that what we are seeing now, what we have now is an opportunity uh, to uh, open up those conversations about adaptation, about whether some of these models are appropriate for us um, and about how we evolve things. Because if a nation with a, a, a democracy uh, well over 200 years old um, can be grappling with these issues, then our democracies uh, can do so. Too. Well, no time like a present, like the present, to be having important conversations like that. Indeed, thank you so much, Dr. Sitembele uh, Mbete, joining us live there via Skype.